Ready so go. hi everybody. Um, don't you want to go to the next screen? Thank you. Today we're going to chat about Nam Namibia. I just returned last week. Um, quite different from the weather here in Chicago, which was a high of 15 today. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, today we are joined with Tad as well. He is from the Cusini Collection and he actually is the U.S. representative for Ultimate Safaris, who is our partner in Namibia. Um, so shortly you'll see a little video from them, which kind of gives a good overview of the country in general. Um, but we're just going to kind of chat through some key areas, um, what there is to see and do in Namibia and why go to Namibia. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. So um, here's a little bit about us in case you guys don't know Africa Endeavors or if this is the first time joining. Um, we basically customize all of our itineraries and work with clients one-on-one -on -one to change to make life-changing um, adventures. So um, here we go. Doug, you want to play the video? Turn the volume up, Doug. Doug, can you turn the volume up? All right, guys, we're just having some volume issues, but hopefully you can still see the pretty scenery. Welcome to Zoom. I'm going to restart this because it is important to list to see some of this stuff. So I'm going to restart this and just uh, just let myself. Oh, there you go. Thanks, I want everybody to hear this. So let's just try this again. There we go. Now we can hear it. This is the journey of a lifetime, set in the protected places and hidden spaces of boundless Namibia. Epic spaces adorned with towering skylines, vast plains and ancient flowing dunes. Filled with magical moments and encounters, experienced with the guardians of these untamed places. And enchanting animals, an amazing cast of the most mesmerizing, captivating creatures in Africa. Of course, someone to guide you, to share new knowledge, surprising secrets and spectacular stories. And support, a passionate tribe of people, ensuring every moment of your adventure is perfect. Safaris, life in reaching journeys. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. I think we can go to the next slide. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, everybody. Thanks, Candice and Africa Endeavors for uh, inviting me today to, um, to join you guys for this virtual tour of Namibia. Um, Candice, as she mentioned, super lucky to have just spent a couple of weeks in Namibia. Um, and while I wish I was 
where this my background puts me in Sosa's play, I'm actually um, in Seattle. So unfortunately, I'm not off in uh, on safari, but I spent a, a, a we number all, of- We were all convinced you, were, you weren't here. <laughs> I was there in I was there in spirit with you guys, but um, I have spent uh, a, a lot of time in Namibia, and it's w really one of my most favorite African countries. Um, I've been blessed to have, have visited on on numerous occasions. Um, and what's really amazing about Namibia, especially in these times, you see some bullet points here, but um, is really the size of the country. Um, you know, it's twice the size of California, or four times the size of the UK. Um, but it actually only has two and a half million people, which was LA has, I think, 10 million people at least on, unto itself in, in California. So it is the second least, most least densely populated countries in the world after Mongolia. For you trivia fans, there's some minutia for you. Um, and as such, you know, social distancing is, you know, was in Namibia before it was even a, an in vogue term as it's become in the last year. Um, it also is very unique in Africa in that it is the first African nation to actually enshrine in its constitution the protection of its land. And today there is upwards of 46%, almost half of the, of the land mass um, in Namibia is actually under some sort of conservation protection. So they've really, they've gazetted conservation in their constitution, which I think, um, again, in these, in these days of, of shrinking uh, protected areas, it's a really important thing when you're considering where to, to travel um, in Africa or anywhere in the world. Um, and it also, because of that protection, um, the, it has the largest population of free roaming cheetah in Africa, as well as a growing and population of, of rhino and the largest population of uh, free roaming black rhino, which is uh, the most endangered rhino species in Africa. Um, and then we'll get more into it later in the presentation, but what's really unique about Namibia beyond the landscapes, which of course you can see from that video are just extraordinary, but it's also these conservation stories that revolve around these really unique adaptations of species like the desert adapted elephant, the desert adapted rhino, and the desert adapted um, lion. And Candace has some experience in the last couple of weeks with I think all three of those species, so she'll talk a little bit more about that. So if we go to the next slide, Doug, Candace will give you a little bit more on what makes Nam Namibia so unique and special. And from yeah, and why Namibia? Um, as Tad had mentioned, mm -hmm. social distancing is natural to the Namibian way, given um, its low population density. Um, guaranteed remote locations with wide open spaces. Tad and I were kind of chatting before this. Um, part, of the, the part of the appeal of Namibia in any time is that you just feel completely isolated and removed from other parts of the world. And I think that's especially um, important now. Um, I think most of my fellow travelers and I can agree there were moments when we didn't even think about COVID and it was actually quite amazing to be in these incredible landscapes and not think about what else is going on in this crazy world. Um, in addition to that, there's choice of small and personal lodges and then for people who are traveling on maybe a higher price point or have a family or a small group, there are some great options for exclusive camps. Um, you also have some options for doing sleep outs under the stars and more camping style um, in certain areas if you tend to be a bit more adventurous. Um, so now we're going to kind of just run through some of the key areas or obviously, um, unfortunately, we can't cover everything, but we thought we'd pick, you know, some of the, the main highlights of, of Namibia and kind of talk through um, those areas and why go there. So. Um, I'm going to chat quickly about Atosha National Park. If you look at the map, it's the one to the north with the big blue salt pan there. Um, so it's obviously in the northern part of the country. So Doug, you can go to the next slide and just kind of flow through these. Um, Atosha really is the best place for wildlife viewing. Four of the big five are there. So that's elephant, rhino, leopard, lion. Um, it's also home to giraffe, hyena, cheetah, tons of other game as well, 114 mammal species, 340 bird species. Um, it also has dramatic scenery, including the Atosha Pan, which what you saw on the map there. And that can actually be seen from space. It's so large, which is pretty incredible. Um, it is best to visit during the dry season. Um, you can take advantage of the, of the um, watering holes throughout the park and they're usually teeming with wildlife. Um, that being said, I went in the green season and we still had, while it wasn't like we mentioned 
in our previous conversation, the Mara necessarily, we still had a great wildlife experience. It's also great for birders. Um, and I mean, on our evening game drive, I think we saw hyena, cheetah, and lion hunting a baby giraffe, which thank God it didn't catch it. So it, it is there, you just have to work a little bit harder. Um, and I think it's more rewarding that way anyway. Um, so where to stay in Atosha, there are a variety of options based on your budget. Um, and I'm gonna just touch briefly on Anguma where we stayed, which was awesome. Um, Will Smith was just there. So um, obviously it's an amazing place. <laughs> um, so actually Anguma is attached to Atosha National Park. So it's on its own private reserve, which is great because it gives you a little bit more flexibility in your activities. Um, so it is about a four hour drive from Vindhook or um, a quick flight. They have a um, private airstrip there, which is amazing if you just want to take that flight and bypass that drive. Um, it also has a great, healthy, and diverse population of wildlife. So that evening drive that I was talking about was actually on that on their property. Um, and from here, you can do a variety of activities. You can do game drives in the park or in the na their nature reserve. Um, you can do bushwalking. They have a photographic hide, which is really cool. You can do guided interpretive walks. Um, they have a pretty interesting um, ranger there who heads the conservation and anti-poaching team. So that's actually a unique um, perspective to kind of pick his brain for an evening. Um, and they also do some really cool experiences in the bush. Like this was a wine tasting they set up for us, which was amazing. That was our sundowner. Um, they do some beautiful like bush breakfast as well as a surprise. So we did a, a morning walk and then walked to this like amazing breakfast. They had mimosas and a great spread. Um, so that's always a nice surprise to have. And there's a few different um, accommodation styles as well. So there's the tented camp. Um, then they have the fort, which is the more high-end like lodge style. Um, they're rebuilding treetops, which will be a tented camp as well. But that will have, um, that'll be more a luxury style with plunge pools and sit more of that fort price point. And then they have a bush camp, which is family friendly. It's spent um, and at a lower price point as well. So a variety of stuff to do there. Um, they also have a working farm, which has a great community story. So you can visit that as an activity if you are interested. Um, and yeah, that's it on, uh, on Atosha. There's obviously a lot more to see and do there and different um, areas of the park you can see, but just as a general overview, that's sort of the main place if you want um, like a traditional safari experience, that's a, that's a good place to start. So Tad, I will let you take it away. So we're gonna head from Atosha, um, which is the national park Candace was just talking about where you see a lot of wildlife out into the very northwest corner of the map there, um, which is the Damar land and Coca land. And um, it is, I think, really the heart of any Namibia safari and really what does make Namibia so special and so unique. This is the home of all of those desert adapted uh, creatures that I was talking about um, earlier. Um, Doug, if you go to the next slide there, it's also just the home of, of big sky country. I know, here in the States, Montana has the slogan, Big Sky Country, but I, I hate to tell you, Montana, Namibia's got you, you beaten um, in, in terms of their big sky. And it's, it's just this incredibly beautiful yet stark environment. Next, next slide, Doug, as well, you'll see here's one of our safari vehicles out in the Damar land with the Brandenburg Mountains behind. And as you can see, you know, t speaking of, of uh, social distancing, no one else around. It does, you know, look reminiscent of the desert southwest. Some of these photos would probably conjure up um, thoughts of Arizona or Utah uh, with the red rocks in that area. Um, and it is, uh, it just, it's, it's an extraordinary place. Um, the next two slides, Doug, if you, if you go through those, just looking at these kind of sunset photos that you can, you can get. Um, and the next slide shows you um, that this is not only a place for for animals um, and these desert adapted creatures, but actually desert adapted human beings as well. For over 6,000 years, this is Twyfelfontein, which is the first UNESCO World Heritage Site that was um, granted or named in Namibia back in 2007. It is um, these amazing petroglyphs or rock art, rock engravings that date back two to 3,000 years from the people that lived in this area. And as you can see just in this photo here, 
there's pictures of all the different wildlife that these people were encountering from lions to elephants to giraffe. Um, and so this is one of the, the highlights or, or one of the spots that you'll visit if you're in Damarland and to see a little bit of the human history of the area and also knowing that the wildlife that you're also encountering has been inhabiting this, this, um, this region for you know, 6,000 years or, or so. So if we go to the next slide, this is when we get into what really makes, um, I think, a Namibian safari, but certainly the Damarland portion of your safari so unique, and that's the desert adapted species. So these are desert adapted elephants. There are only two places in Africa where you can find this um, subspecies, and that's in um, Namibia and in Mali. Unfortunately, in Mali, the, the population has shrunk considerably. That's the Sahara Desert. Here you're in the Namib Desert. And um, while they're not a separate species entirely, they have these adaptations to create a subspecies. And some of those adaptations are larger feet um, and longer legs for traveling longer distance to try to find um, water. And then they also live in smaller family groups because obviously water is, is, a, you know, is harder to find in the desert. So the, the families tend to be smaller than you would find with other elephants in other parts of, um, of Africa where there's more abundant water. Um, and back in the early or late um, in the 1980s, the population of these desert adapted elephants was almost entirely wiped out um, thanks to the, you know, the, the um, things that were happening at that time in, in Africa and in Namibia. But um, today there's a healthy population of about 600 or more desert adapted elephants and you're almost guaranteed to see them on a safari in this part of the country. Overall, Namibia's population of elephants is actually fairly stable and healthy as well, of over 24,000. So that's some, some good news. Um, the next couple of slides, we'll do another picture of those elephants and then show the rhino here, which is another really special part of, of uh, Damarland, is being able to spend some time tracking these very endangered black rhino species. As I mentioned, Namibia actually has a growing population of rhino, which is unheard of in Africa, sadly, these days. It also has the largest population of free roaming Rhino. So these rhino are not on fenced reserves somewhere and, and being protected, which happens elsewhere in Africa, and that's a good thing. But here in Namibia, they actually are able to roam throughout these community conservancies um, that are, that are um, created to empower the local communities to want to protect wildlife. Obviously, the, the benefit is that tourism comes in and provides some, some economic incentive uh, to protect that wildlife, and it's been hugely successful in Namibia in protecting these really rare and endangered species. And then the desert adapt, and you can actually track them on foot, as you can see with these guests here. There's several places, several reserves to be able to do that, or conservancies to be able to do that, including one of our own called the Huop Conservancy, where you can actually have an exclusive use camp just for your group. Great for, you know, uh, family, multi-generational family groups, uh, where you can have the entire camp to yourself and go tracking these desert adapted um, rhino on your own. And then there's the lions. There's, um, again, these lions were almost entirely wiped out back uh, in the early 80s and 90s. And today there's a population of about 150 of these really unique species of lions who have learned to adapt to living in the desert um, and actually um, have been documented in recent months or years to be hunting on the coast, on the skeleton coast, which um, Candace will talk more about your experiences on the skeleton coast, but something very unique. These are just some iconic pictures of uh, the oryx, which is really one of the, the iconic um, creatures in Namibia um, that you'll see throughout the country. Here they are in some of those harsh dunes in the Damar land um, or Juanib area. And then um, finishing up here with, um, so again, some people and, and there's opportunities in the, um, in the Coca land area and the Juanib area where, where Candace was to actually interact with the Himba tribes, which are um, you know, nomadic tribes, herders um, who are um, really living a very, traditional lifestyle, as you can see in that photo there. So Candace can um, talk a little bit more about, um, I believe you had a, a chance to, to meet some of the Himba yeah, in the had, Wana Valley. Yeah, when we were in Wana Valley. I don't have any photos, unfortunately, but it was like such an amazing morning. And I think um, everybody from our group would agree. It just, from a cultural experience, sometimes those can be really sterile and a bit uncomfortable because 
you, you feel like you're just kind of staring at people like they're in a zoo in some ways. Um, but we had a great interaction with them. They love to see photos of themselves. So we had um, kids looking at videos and photos and everybody was laughing and it just felt really personal. Um, and we just visited a small family who live in an outpost from the main village. Um, so yeah, really unique experience. And if you guys ever, we have an earlier um, webinar that we did last year um, with community and conservation and my colleague Shannon talked a little bit about her experience at a different Himba village um, and how much she loved it. So I think this is, I mean, this is so uniquely Namibian, obviously, but it's such an, a, a warm and, and loving, I don't know, loving is a weird way, way to term, but to term to use, but I felt like, you know, really connected to these people in some way. And it really was one of like the best mornings um, of the trip. So you do have to go a bit out of your way to see them, but it was um, it was amazing just to see them and learn about their lifestyle and just, um, yeah, I mean, fascinating stories. I'm not gonna go into it now, but yeah, there are some, they're an interesting culture for sure. Um, and then where to stay, just to kind of touch on this briefly, there's a couple. So we stayed at Moani Mountain Camp while we were there, which is this um, tented camp, um, beautiful views, kind of set up in the granite boulders. Um, Great spot for sundowners if you can see that top photo. I mean, those are like epic. There's a little bar off to the corner and they have like pillows and chairs laid out and everybody sits there and they bring you drinks and canapes and it's just, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, it also gets a little hot in the area in the afternoon. So Moani has a beautiful breeze that comes through about four o'clock um, and they have a great pool. So it's a good time to cool down. Um, just something to keep in mind. And then um, later on in the trip, we stayed, Doug, you can go to the next slide. We stayed at Wanib um, Valley Camp. This is like truly isolated. It was probably about a four or five hour drive to get there, like stunning, epic scenery. Um, wild, desert adapted wildlife peppered along the way. Um, did not see any rhino, unfortunately, but saw plenty of elephant. And then while we were staying here too, we got to see um, the local pride of lions. So that was a cool experience. Um, but yeah, just a really amazing small camp. There's only six tents. I think Prince William or Prince Harry, one of them stayed here when they came through. Um, so, um, great staff. It was, yeah, it was, it was amazing just to sit out on your deck and like read a book and just stare off into the desert and know that you, you feel millions of miles away from like the next human. So, um, yeah, so that is, and then Ted, I think you wanted to talk really quickly about the new property coming online, which we don't. Yeah, so. we're, um, we're about to open a new uh, camp in the same area in the Damarland area called Unduli, Camp Unduli, which means um, giraffe in the local, in the local dialect. It's going to be six um, kind of semi-open, open air um, uh, tented accommodations and it's in it's in a very beautiful location with incredible views similar to those those views you saw there from Moani um, also accessible to Twyfelfontein um, but in the reserve you'll be able to track desert adapted elephants as well as desert adapted rhino um, and uh, we hope to have it open here in the next couple of, of months um, if not uh, for actually we're looking at the next couple of weeks and I know Shannon you got to or sorry Candice you got to uh, see it before I've seen it in person, um, having sundowners there on your trip as well. Yeah, it's beautiful. So it'll definitely be a great addition to, um, to the other options there. But yeah, certainly unique and beautiful view. So watch this space for that coming online soon, hopefully. I know it's like a passion project for everybody. So it's quite amazing. Um, okay, so moving on, we're gonna, I'm going to chat about the Skeleton Coast, which is a place that I've dreamed of going for probably since I've ever heard of Namibia. So I was pretty excited to be able to go this time because it is very remote and isolated and not the easiest place to go to. So if you just look on the map, um, I mean, it doesn't stretch the entire length of the, of the map, but pretty much from midway up um, is the Skeleton Coast. Um, it's about 500 kilometers long and it comes, the name comes from the amount uh, or the stranded whales that um, used to kind of wash up on shore back in the day um, and the skeletons would sort of be scattered all over and sometimes you can see a few of those still left I mean there's not like few huge whale bones that I saw but um, it's also home to numerous ships that were stranded due to like the rough seas and the thick fog and there's some pretty interesting stories um, that go along with that so here's just a little map that I actually pulled from Shipwreck Lodge they're 
book and it kind of shows you what shipwrecks are um, kind of peppered along the way. And all the rooms at the lodge are actually named after a specific wreck of some sort with a story behind it. So that's kind of cool. I mean, not cool if you're on the ship, but <laughs> great from a historical perspective. Um, so yeah, I mean, as Tad mentioned, we unfortunately did not get to see them, but if you're lucky, um, those desert adapted elk or um, lions do come to the shore here sometimes and, and have been known to hunt. I think they eat birds or something from what I understand, but. Yeah, bird, seabirds and seals. I mean, the, seals. what's unique about, and, and Dr. Flip Stander, who is the, um, who has been studying desert lions for decades with the desert lion conservation, um, he, uh, he's recently documented lions stalking and hunting seals. And these lions used to do this decades ago, but they had forgotten essentially that, that learn to be, you know, lions are like humans. You learn how to behave from your parents. Um, and so that, that um, knowing that you could hunt these things that are in the water had, had been forgotten essentially. And so you, not to mention a lot of the lions um, because of, various reasons, human wildlife conflict and others hadn't been able to access the, the coast for many years. Um, and now, and I, I don't know all of the reasons behind it, but I think there will be a documentary about it released at some point in the next year or so. There was a pride of lions that began to figure out that, oh, <laughs> this, and there's lots of seals in Namibia. Um, these, this is easy prey. And they began to figure out that they, they were, um, they were great, great dinner. And so that behavior will then at least with this pride, be passed along to the next generation, um, which is great for the lions because it does provide a source of, you know, of, uh, of a predator or of um, prey for them that's fairly easy and fairly consistent. And in, in a place like the Skeleton Coast and in the, in the Damarland northwest part of Namibia, having, you know, easy prey is, is not something that's, uh, you know, have, you're always looking for water and you're always looking for food because it is a desert. So, it's a nice thing to be able to um, to know that you have some consistent um, some consistent dinner on the coast. Not if you're the seal, though. Not if you're a seal. I mean, it all it's all dirty. Yeah, business. we did run into Flip, so we didn't see the lion, but we saw the lion researcher. So that was pretty exciting. Um, apparently, we learned he has. I don't have a picture of his truck, but he's got a set of turntables, and he is known to DJ now and then. So I think it'd be pretty epic to listen to that in the middle of the desert. But yeah. um, another day. Um, so yeah, so this is just a picture of the um, clay castles, and this is this is one reason why it's it's nice to do a drive from Wanab into the Skeleton Coast because this is actually it's still quite a bit of a ways from the coast, and this is actually one of the day excursions from staying at Shipwreck. So if you were to fly into Shipwreck, um, which is even the airstrip's a bit a bit away, you would still you'd have to take a bit of time to kind of go back to see scenery like this. So with the self, with not the self drive, with the drive, you kind of get the scenery on the, on the way and then you've got your time at the lodge, which I will speak to shortly. There is a bunch of stuff to see and do there and it's quite amazing. Um, oh, this is my like photo Doug loves to make fun of, but it's just, Doug, if you can go back, like we had this awesome sundowner up on the dunes and I mean, it's, as far as the eye can see, there's not another human, not another building. Um, you just really are in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, and besides that, Tad mentioned, and besides the harsh climate, you do kind of see all these footprints of animals out, along the sand dunes or along the beach. And it is quite amazing to think that they can survive in, in such a harsh, harsh environment. Um, okay, Doug, you can go, uh, go ahead. Um, so these, this is just some of the scenery from the Skeleton Coast. Um, obviously, just unbelievable. This is the, the view from the deck at Shipwreck Lodge, just staring out. You're about one and a half miles from the ocean, so it's not right there, but you can certainly see it. It is a bit of a walk, but um, quite beautiful. You can just keep going. This is a bush, uh, sorry, bush, a beach picnic they set up for us one day. Um, Again, as you see, there's like not another vehicle, human building in sight. Um, and then Doug, you can just keep scrolling through. And so just a couple of things you can actually do at Shipwreck Lodge. There's, um, besides the clay castles, which we discussed, they also have 
um, sand tobogganing, which I did not do, but others in my group did and had a blast. Um, you can do ATVs, um, the beach picnics that we mentioned previously, they have incredible sundowners on those sand dunes, or you can do them at the beach as well. Um, there's a local seal colony that, that Tad mentioned. Hopefully there won't be a lion eating them, or maybe luckily they will, I don't know. Um, but you can also spot the shipwrecks and different bones scattered along the coast. Um, but really this place is just, it's a great place just to kind of chill out too. I mean, the scenery is amazing and just kind of appreciate how removed you are from the rest of the world. Um, and then as you can see, the, the architecture is quite stunning and unique for Shipwreck Lodge. Doug, like you can kind of just plow through these. Um, great staff, it's a small intimate camp. Um, we were laughing because it was quite warm while we were there and this lodge is really built for cold weather. So every night they were asking us for fires and hot water bottles and it was like 90 degrees out so um but i mean you can imagine how beautiful it is when that mist rolls in um, and it's those cool evenings so yeah really unique there's not really any other places like this um to stay so this has got to be like the place to stay in, in the skeleton coats if you if you want my opinion so i'm very happy to stay, be to have stayed there um it was quite quite unbelievable um so yeah, moving on from there, Tad is going to talk, but we're going back to the desert. Yeah, you guys are lucky to have it be warm on the Skeleton Coast because it's not very often that you have, I mean, this yeah. time of year is the time of year if you want to have, yeah. have it be warm. Well, and we had like clear, pristine days, so yeah. I mean, certainly take the heat for that. I mean, the weather, I mean, once, you, once you got down to the beach, it was beautiful, so um, it was worth it for sure. So we're going to go from the um, Skeleton Coast uh, down to Sosa's Flay and the Namib Rand, which is um, what many people think of when they think of Namibia are the Sosa's Flay dunes. On the map there, um, kind of if you look dread directly in the center, you see Vintook, and then a little bit to the southwest uh, is the Sosa's Flay area. This is again the Namib uh, Desert, which is actually the oldest desert in the world, 55 million years old. Um, and Sosa's Flay is known as um, there's a debate on this, but uh, the Nibians would claim that they are the highest dunes in the world, but they're certainly some of the highest dunes in the world, the highest being at over 1,200 feet or the size of a, of a six story, a 60 story building. So really, really high dunes. Um, if you go to the next slide, Doug, there's a couple of shots of what those dunes look like. For photographers, this is um, one of the most in demand places in Namibia to, to spend some time um, being able to get there. This is just right at, at sunrise having the light hit those dunes um, to be able to get those amazing shots. And there's certain ways, if you are a photographer, that, um, that you want to plan your time in, in Sosa's Flay and certain lodges that you want to likely stay at in order to be able to get to these dunes at the right time of day to get those, that morning sun or that, that you know, the, the contrast between um, the dark and the light there, as you saw in the previous shot. Um, if you continue on, Doug, we're going to get to Dead Vlay, which is um, this incredibly ghostly, um, ethereal, otherworldly place. It's actually a former um, uh, lake, um, ephemeral lake, which would get flooded during certain times of year. Um, and then after you know, a certain period, the sand actually cut off the, um, the ephemeral river, the seasonal river that would have come and fed this area. So I think these, these trees, now these camel thorn trees are about 600 to 900 years old, and they are basically now stranded in the middle of this um, of this dry lake bed, and it's it's just one of the most uh, photographed places in Namibia um, for sure is to experience you know this area here. And again, as Candace said, and this is a theme with Namibia, it's you, it's the dunes, it's these ancient what look to be petrified camel thorn trees, and nothing else. It's really um, it's a really cool place to get away from people for sure. And then to the next slide, Doug, um, just talking about uh, the Namib Rand, which is a a reserve that borders Sosa's Flay and then and the Namib Nakloof National Park that also is just extraordinary for photography. There's some amazing lodges in this um, reserve, like the and Beyond um, Sosa's Flay Desert Lodge in particular is one of our favorites. But you can see these, there's just the colors and the contrast between the different um, you know, shades of sand and the and the uh, mountains and the plains beyond. It's just, you know, you cannot stop taking photos. I was saying to Candace earlier before we started it, you know, there's there's not a ton of wildlife in Sosa's Flay. It's, you'll see oryx, you'll see um, uh, giraffe, or you'll see, I'm not giraffe, you'll see um, zebra, you'll see springbok. 
and you're gonna see lots and lots of zebra. And I, I just remember being in Sosa's Flay and taking endless pictures of zebra herds. And if you've been on safari in Africa, if you're lucky to have done that, um, you will have seen many, many zebra. They are kind of ubiquitous. Um, and I just couldn't figure out why was it taking so many pictures of zebra? And it was because of the landscapes behind them. It just makes you want to take more photos. If you're gonna, like the photo behind me, here it is again, um, getting up into a balloon over Sosa's Flay is definitely a must do to be able to be there at sunrise, to watch the sun rise over these incredible uh, red sand dunes, and then to have a champagne uh, breakfast afterwards. Candace, I know that you would sign up for that for sure. Very it great. is also one of the best places in Namibia, if not in Africa for sundowners. That's actually my lovely wife um, on a reserve near Sosa's Flay a few years ago when we were there, um, just having, you know, watching the sunset. We had been swimming in this pool before and uh, enjoying a gin and tonic as the sun set over those dunes. It is a, it's a, it's a special place and a good place to end your safari. We generally recommend people try to start, if possible, in the north, going to Atosha, then to Damarland, and then ending in Sosa's Flay, because then you can really enjoy the landscapes, the sundowners. You're not too worried about trying to see a lot of um, wildlife or at least big game, um, and it's a kind of a nice way to just chill out at the end. And then the final slide here is of the dark sky. So the Namib Rand Reserve, which is again bordering Sosa's Flay is actually one of only 18 dark sky reserves in the world. So if you are at all into astronomy, um, this is you know, one of the best top 18 places in the world to go and explore the universe and the cosmos. Um, this is actually a, a photo from the and beyond property there, the Sosa Slay Desert Lodge, which has a resident astrologist, um, sorry, astronomer, not astrology, astronomer there throughout the year um, and they have a, a telescope that allows you to really um, you know, see deep into the, into the universe and somebody that can interpret what you're seeing. But all of our guides as well, even if you're not staying at, at um, Sosa Slay Desert Lodge, they all know, um, you know a, a little bit about the, uh, the sky and the stars and what you're looking at. You can see the Milky Way there, of course, um, and they can do a little um, galaxy tour for you as well. But, if you are really into um, into space, then I would say the Sosa Slate Desert Lodge would be a place to, to definitely stay in, in this area. Yeah, Southern Hemisphere skies, it is, they are magical, Corinne, you, you know for sure. So there you go, we're gonna finish up there and Candace, I'll give it back to you to talk about our next, our next stop. <laughs> With Tad again, actually, I don't know if he'll be joining us, but um, up next, thank you guys. Also, we're gonna to get to Q&A in a second. Um, I just kind of want to run through our next Travel Tuesdays, which will be March 2nd, and that will be with Toto Santos Eco Adventures in Baja, um, California. So a little bit closer to home, but they do offer some really cool adventures, um, atypical from your Mexico resort style. So Tad, I don't know if you will be on there, but you might see Tad again. We'll TBD on that one. Um, and then thank you for attending. Um, and if you'd like to discuss your adventure in more detail, you can contact me or our info account at Africa Endeavors or give us a call at 312-951-8517. Um, and we'd love to help you. Um, Africa is open. And even though it's, I know, a difficult time to travel for many people, um, and we can, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about what travel is like right now. Um, but you can feel confident in, these destinations that they're taking COVID very seriously um, and they're doing everything to make sure you have a safe and amazing experience. And there's like no people there. So it's like the best time to do it. <laughs> so, um, all right, now we're just gonna drop the screen um, so we can see everybody's faces if they want um, and just open it up for questions. See one here from Kristen about Vintook, Candace, um, asking if it's a city worth spending a couple of days in after you fly in. Um, I, I like, I love Vintook. In fact, after my last trip there, I, I wanted to move to Vintook, not just because of Vintook, but because of Namibia. Um, and it's, it reminds me a bit of, of Tucson, again, like desert Southwest, high desert. Um, it's a very livable city. As far as tourism goes, you know, it's usually a one or two night stop beforehand or after. Um, there is some things to see, you know, touring wise. Um, a, we have an, an amazing art tour actually that is kind of interesting to, to go and visit some of the artists that live in Vintook um, and the artisans doing various types of, of uh, a visual art. But most people spend a night there prior to heading off on safari and maybe a night at the end. Right now with you know COVID times, you probably need to spend a couple of nights maybe at the end just to, in terms of your testing. Um, but it's a very, it's a, it's a nice city. 
but I wouldn't say there's a there's a ton um, of additional things to see there that would require you to stay more than a, a, a night or two. We, yeah, we didn't get to do the arch where it wasn't running, um, but we did do some self-driven sh uh, shopping. shopping. Yeah. <laughs> so that was really cool. We went to the local fabric <clears throat> local fabric store because everybody wanted shui shui. And if you, that's an African um, wax fabric that they make in South Africa and they come in beautiful colors um, and it's great value. So you can bring it back and make like kids dresses or adult dresses, like pillows, whatever you want. So that was a really fun trip. And then they have a crafts market there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, definitely as far as a, a like a urban it, experience it's quieter um somebody did ask about travel requirements and i will touch on that but i because i did get stuck in um been hooked for two extra days because of the new testing requirements and we actually stayed um at omanda which was lovely and that's about 45 minutes outside of town um so you could potentially do some like a half day in been hook and then if you wanted more of a resort experience not resort, it's more, you can do, a, it's on a safari reserve, um, but more of a kind of relaxing experience to either begin or end your trip. That is also a great option. So something to think about. Um, but yeah, like Tab was saying, if you want to stay in, in the city, um, I would say about one to two nights. Cause I think it's, it's definitely small. You can do it, do it justice probably in that time frame. Um, and then travel requirements. I mean, those are, changing a lot but right now to get into Namibia you need a negative PCR test for from seven days of departure um, so that's quite easy coming from the states at this point the difficulty when I was coming home was the new regulations for COVID tests in the U.S. and what happened was I was on the skeleton coast in the middle of nowhere and I wasn't going to get a COVID test in time. So other than that though, most places in Namibia, as long as you know ahead of time, we can make sure it's organized. This was just a last minute change um, which happened, which is why we were left having to change our flights um, and stay a bit longer, which in hindsight, I missed a major snowstorm here, so I was happy to do that. Um, but yeah, they have great clinics. Ultimate um, was amazing in making sure we got our tests and back in, a, in time. Tristan, one of the co-owners of the company, was like on the phone with the testing company. Um, so that's why it's great to have a partner office there. But yeah, we just went to a clinic. Super easy. Took about 10 minutes total for like six of us to get tested. Did the swap and then off you go. Um, and then since you only need the antigen, rapid antigen to get back, they're actually um, in the process in the movie and government of getting those approved now. So that'll make things even easier to get home. Um, but at the time they only had the PCR, which is why the time frame took a bit longer. But yeah, it was quite, it was quite easy. Um, to be honest, coming home, it was probably the most um, investigation of my documents were at the check-in counter in Vinhook and then nobody looked at anything. Not even during passport control in Europe. I actually asked the guy if he wanted to see my negative test. Um, so nobody looked at it. You still need the test, but it wasn't nearly as vigorous as I thought it was going to be. And I think everybody else had very similar experiences. Um, sorry, let me just see. Um, can you highlight the difference between fly versus drive? Sorry, Tab, are you gonna say something? Yeah, just on that, a fly versus drive safaris. Um, you know, historically Namibia has been thought of as a fly-in destination because as I said, it's twice the size of California, so their distances are pretty vast. And there is definitely a value to doing some flights to try to reduce those, you know, longer drives. But as um, Candace can attest to on, on her trip where it was an entirely, um, you know, driving, private guided driving safari. There's a lot in Namibia that you miss if you fly over these places. Um, and there's something to be said for developing a rapport and a relationship with your private guide. Um, especially in Damarland, I think you, you definitely want to, to have that private guided experience um, and be able to you know, go on essentially a, an African or a Namibian road trip. There's so much geologically, culturally, landscape-wise, wildlife-wise, that you um, experience while you're driving between places. Um, and we're not talking about, you know, 12 to 15 hour drives. We're in some cases talking about four to six hour drives. And while, you know, that may seem long for Americans, it's just a drive around the corner for most Namibians. And, um, and that you learn so much about your, um, about the country when you're on those drives. So 
<clears throat> I think one of the good ways to do it is to try to drive the northern part of the country. And that is, you know, Damar land and Atosha, as um, Candace was talking about. And then if you want to um, fly in or out of Sosa's Flay at the end, it's a little bit less important to have that naturalist private guide in the southern part in Sosa's Flay because there's there's just um, there's less interpretation in many ways to be done there. Um, and you, most people will just spend two or three nights at a single lodge in Sosa's Flay to experience the dunes and you know do a few other things in that area. So that's a good way to, if you're looking to try to save some um, you know, road miles is to is to fly into Sosa's Flay and then drive in the northern part of the country. I have nothing to add to that. I agree with Tad. <laughs> Thanks, Tad. Um, I okay. So Catherine also asked, "What if you're traveling in multiple African countries? How is COVID handled?" So you know, Catherine, I think to that it really is going to depend on when you're looking to travel. I mean, if you want to go like next week, I would say try and keep it to single country just, just because it, with things changing, it gets a little bit complicated. Um, but if it's farther out, you know, and the fact that we have testing required to get, get back in the US now, I mean, that I think in, in the long run, it's gonna make things much easier because we have our expectations set. So now we know what we're dealing with. Um, and it just gets more complicated because the, the testing rules change per country. So, um, it just will just depend on which country, like if you're gonna do Namibia in South Africa, like that's quite easily done. Um, if you wanna do Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe and Zambia, you know, it, it gets a little bit more complicated when you start adding in, in more countries. But generally speaking, it, it can be done. Right now, if you're going in the next couple of months, we probably recommend keeping it to one country. Um, but you know we we're certainly managing like dual dual countries like Botswana and South Africa and things that are a little bit more straightforward. It gets more complicated, um, like in Tanzania, for instance, that doesn't actually acknowledge COVID. <laughs> so things like that make it more complicated. But at least in Southern Africa, um, they do have a lot of rules in place, and and generally they're along the same guidelines. They might tweak them here and there, but. Um, but it is possible. We're just, you just need to be a little bit flexible if you're looking to travel sometime soon. Testing is, is pretty widely available throughout the, yeah. you know, the continent and certainly in Southern Africa, a lot of airports, Johannesburg, which is a big gateway for Southern Africa. You can get tested at the airport. The turnaround time is depending on whether it's antigen or PCR anywhere from, you know, four hours to 24 hours. So they've, they've really figured out how to make it as, um, relatively painless as possible to be able to get tested if you are transiting to another country in the region or now in, in the case of the U.S., you know, returning home where you do have to have that negative test. Yeah, and it's just a matter of, of knowing kind of ahead of time. So I think now that the U.S. does require it, we know that that's kind of our baseline and that makes it a bit easier to, to plan. Yeah. But yeah, as Ted was saying, I mean, I was working on a client today and she she's going to be in Hermanus, which is just this small little town outside of Cape Town and she can get a PCR test and get the results in um, in like 24 hours. So it's it is readily available. It's just it's just about knowing and, and being able to plan. Um, Ted, do you want to take the dry season question? Yeah, so the dry season is generally and I say generally because today, you know, everything is up for debate with climate change and all but you know, the dry season is generally from about May through October or November. Um, and so your green season is, you know, the rains typically would start sometime in November or early December and run intermittently through uh, March or April. Um, and then you have a shoulder season, which is, which is May. Um, in terms of, uh, of package tours, um, we do, at Ultimate Safaris does have some scheduled group departures that we work with Africa Endeavors on. There are small group tours um, maximum of seven guests. Um, right now we're actually doing maximum of four through through Mar the end of March. So if you're itching to go somewhere with a small group, but a very small group, now's the time and the price is the same. Um, and those depart, you know, just about every week or, you know, at least two or three times a week during the, or two or three times a month during the, the peak season. 
Um, and we've got two different options, but they're both basically similar experiences. You're going to see Celsius Flay. You're going to go to Swakamund, which you didn't talk about, which is the, the coast of Namibia. Um, you're going to spend time tracking desert adapted species in Damarland, and then you're going to go to Atosha as well. So, um, and those are really well priced because they are our group tours. All the protocols are in place for those as they would be for any private safari. Um, but really what we do best in, with, you know, Candace and, and their team at African Endeavors is, is customize tours. But if you're looking for something that's a little bit more, um, it's either that's a group or that's already set up, those are an option which Candace can definitely send through to you. And they're all private guided as well. You're with your own guide in, in one vehicle. Um, so while they're not custom designed, they are still feel very exclusive. And the ultimate guides are great. So that's also another. Our guides are amazing, yeah. Yeah, we should yeah. mention like great personalities, great knowledge. So um, that, makes, that makes such a difference, I think too. Um, and we will follow up with everybody who attended. So um, no worries, Lois, if you want some more, more information for sure, you'll definitely get an email from either myself or one of my colleagues and we can take it from there. Um, but does anybody else have any other questions at this point? No? Well, thank you. I'm going to say good night then to everybody. Thanks again for joining. We really appreciate it. Um, again, we will follow up, but if you guys have any other questions, um, I will certainly, sorry, I'm just seeing another question come through. Um, Kristen? Kristen, we can reach out to you and we'll, we'll chat further. So I'll make sure to touch base with you after we, um, after we hang up. But yeah, thank you again, everybody for, for coming. Um, this, is, this has been recorded. So there'll also be a copy on YouTube that you can watch if you just really wanna hear my voice again <laughs> or remember more details about Namibia. Um, but yeah, again, don't forget March 2nd is our next um, Travel Tuesday. And then the following one I think is gonna be March 23rd. And we're gonna go back to Australia with one of our mates, Craig Wickham from Kangaroo Island. So um, yeah, everyone have a great night. Stay warm if you're in the Arctic tundra like me. Um, but yeah, thanks again. And Tad, thank you so much for joining us and helping us out and for your support. As always, we always appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Candace. Thanks, Candace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.